What's up, everybody? Welcome back. We are here with yet another episode of Your Life, God's Word. I'm excited to be back with one of these. It's been a couple of weeks. We've done some interviews with some awesome people. Definitely go check out those episodes. We just did one with Roger Perkins on uh, Trinity, Oneness, kind of our God's Nature series. So check that one out, as well as our episode with the folks from Changed Movement discussing the LGBT community and how Christians can really be Christ-like when working with folks that are having um, you know, issues with identity or sexuality and things like that. So definitely go check those videos out. I highly, highly, highly recommend them. Also, for those that want to be part of the Breadbreakers community, a little bit more interaction, it's not super easy to do on YouTube. So we uh, we we obviously have a Facebook page. I mean, I think most people already know that. We've got a Facebook page, and that's a great place where we, we will post additional things, things going on uh, with the local community, as well as things to share with folks that's not really a YouTube video-esque type of thing. So definitely check out the Facebook page for Bread Breakers as well. Obviously, give us that thumbs up every time you like a video. Um, every time you watch a video and you're, it's interesting or it's helpful, please give us that thumbs up. Why? YouTube actually looks at those. You and I may not care so much about it, but YouTube looks at that and says, hey, this is a video people are liking. I'm going to use my algorithm to push this in front of more people. So that is actually very, very helpful. If you could please do that, we would greatly appreciate it as well. Well, we want to hear your comments. We want to hear what you have to uh, say, what's on your hearts or your questions. So you can always hit us up again on Facebook, or you can hit us up podcast at breadbreakers.com is the email podcast at breadbreakers.com with questions or content suggestions, things of that nature. I think we got some exciting things coming up over the next few weeks that you'll enjoy. Um, but I'm back today, just me in front of the microphone for good or for bad. So this might be the the minute and a half that some people check out, um, but some maybe will we'll, we'll keep it up. And if you're listening on Spotify um, or one of the other podcast services, uh, definitely, you know, stick with us, stick with us. And if you're not part of YouTube and Facebook, jump over there and join that as well. So um, we did several weeks ago for Father's Day, we, I, did a, um, I did an episode called Act Like Men. And again, one I recommend, I've actually had quite a bit of feedback on that one, people telling me that they, they really enjoyed it and it really you know, challenged them <clears throat> because our, our world today pushes men to be wimps, sissies, complacent, um, just little, really little ninnies and, and not actually be what men are geared for, both biologically, just that that's, that's who and what we are. Um, physiologically, emotionally, biologically, you know, physically, everything. I mean, that's men are geared toward a certain thing. Even if you don't believe in God, you can just see men are men tend to gravitate toward these types of things and topics, and and they they are generally uh, more physically uh, uh, adept, right? So there's certain tasks and jobs and duties that just make more sense for someone that's bigger, stronger, you know, more durable to to do right and then women have a sphere where they operate and yeah it's not that men can't be those things or try to do some of those things of course men can't have babies but but <laughs> i mean some things right? women, women have a superpower that men cannot emulate or even attempt to to do but outside of that you know when people think about women being nurturing or caring or whatever, it's not that men are cannot be or, or should not be but generally they're better at it right so there are certain things and even jobs and different things that uh, that women tend to excel and be better at just naturally. But our, our society wants to blur these lines. Obviously, it's 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 design. It's by design. If you don't, again, don't believe in God, it is a design to get people to be standardized. It's standardization on a human level, right? We want everybody just to be cogs and wheels, interchangeable. This is the vision. This is the future. I think maybe I'll deal with some of that. Um, in an upcoming podcast, if you've ever heard of the World Economic Forum, it many of the things that they come up with are right out of a, a James Bond movie. <laughs> a lot of these guys that are like billionaires around the world, I mean, they are they don't even realize. It's like, look in the mirror, bro. You literally are a Bond villain. A villain. 
<laughs> like, I mean, so again, you can look some of that stuff up yourself. But I think it's interesting to talk about because from a scriptural perspective, we if we believe things might be coming like a one world government, one world currency, one world, um, you know, kind of push toward even religion and different things. And we are very well set up for that. Now, I know people have been saying that for 100 years, but 100 years ago, they weren't thinking about digital currency, right? They weren't thinking about microchipping people. Um, and in, in that microchip is everything about you, your data, your health records, your your uh, financial. I mean, you can't buy or sell. You know, it's difficult to do that when there's paper currency or gold or whatever. But if it's all microchip based, there's no paper. And the bank, if they wanted to, or the government, if they wanted to, could shut off your funds just like that or make you spend in certain ways or whatever. I mean, it's it's absolutely possible right now. Today, they could absolutely do it. So if you believe in that kind of thing, I mean, we're, we're set up for it. So again, I think it's an interesting topic. Maybe we'll do that um, in an upcoming episode. That'd be pretty cool. Um, I am going to try and keep this one under that, you know, <laughs> we've been doing with the interviews, hour and a half, hour and 45, two hours. And I was over a friend's house recently and uh, uh, the, 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 his, his wife, were, she was like, ah, yeah, I, I like the podcast. But man, after about, you know, after about 45 minutes or so, like, you, you know, you just got to stop. <laughs> so I'm going to try and uh, accommodate today, but no promises. Nope. No promises. Um, so anyway, back to what I was saying, the act like men. See, you thought I got off track and, uh, mm -hmm. actually I kind of did, but I, I just reminded, I, I just reminded myself the, um, the act like men, we talked about, um, the, the the cardinal, what's known as the four cardinal virtues, fortitude, temperance, justice, and prudence. And so I thought it'd be interesting to dive into each of these separately, maybe do a separate podcast for each one, or if a couple of them just make sense to do them together. So today I want to talk about, I want to talk about fortitude or courage. And in the context of doing this, if we do three or four of these, I want to, I want to challenge people to be warriors not wimps. Warriors, not wimps. Because it's easy to be a wimp, and our world sort of pushes people to be wimps. Um, I, I would say 60, 70 years ago, that was not the case. It was the rugged individual um, that that sort of won the day in the public sphere, in the public mind. But I over... And it wasn't that people didn't like that or fought against that. I mean, you can read... You can read books um, from you know the 30s, 40s, 50s, and and this was definitely under attack then. But now it's at the point where it's almost like the norm, the default neutral position, is be a wimp, don't stand out, don't take risks, right? <laughs> don't be different. And then you you're you're the counterculture if you're going against that. And so I, my challenge is to be warriors and not wimps. And I, my definition for this, as we talk through these, however many episodes we do, my definition for this is a warrior is one who knows God's word and does it. Knows God's word and does it. Um, so that's the context of sort of being a warrior. Because I'm, I'm not talking about going out there and grabbing a sword and busting open a government building and... Um, you know, splitting somebody's desk in half with your giant barbarian sword or anything. I'm talking about a warrior that matters. The only warriors that really matter are warriors in the army of Jesus Christ, because eternally, that really matters, that's all that matters. If we believe that this life is a vapor, if we believe that this life is is, is, is just temporary, it, this is really the, the, the fake world. The eternal world existed before this world, this world is here now, and then this world will go away. So which one is really reality? <laughs> reality is the one that is standing the test of time, right? So, well, outside of time. Um, so that that's kind of the context I'm putting it in. When I say warrior at, through this, you know, be a warrior, I'm talking about you know God's word, you know his precepts, his, his kingdom principles, you know them and you do them. So the first one I want to talk about, first thing I want to talk about is, is courage or fortitude. Because um, I think we are, I think we lack a lot of, I think we lack a lot of courage. 
I think people aren't brought up to have fortitude. And I'll get into this more and more. And you know, I think you'll agree with me, especially the last couple of generations of people that have been born, and I'll say in the last 40 years or so, courage slash fortitude are just not things that are, are pushed into us. Um, let me let me go to First Chronicles 28 and 20. This is where David is sort of giving his spiel to his son Solomon. Solomon's going to be king. He's passing the torch. And, and, and this is First Chronicles 28 and 20. David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. And so I think, again, we can go to many, many scriptures. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, for instance, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Or again, some, some versions say, you know, act like men. This is what we, we used before, but it talks about being being on your guard, being strong, right? Um, we need to be be people that are courageous, that, that we need courage. We need courage. Fortitude or courage does not, it's not necessarily a natural thing. And so we have to, we have to generate it. We have to work on it. We have to get better at it. You know, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Why would we deny Jesus? Well, most of the time it's because there's something that's going to challenge us or come against us or rub us the wrong way or whatever it might be or put us in an awkward position. And will we have the courage to stand or will we succumb to the onslaught of the world? Satan is no fool. Um, yes, God has certainly fooled him and used him, and uh, you know, poor poor fella had been used and abused by God over and over again. But really, that's because God, in His infinite wisdom, is able every time to outsmart, outwit, outdo Satan. But when it comes to Him versus us, Him being Satan, uh, I mean, He is very <laughs> knowledgeable. He He knows a lot. He's got power. Uh, and so we need to be careful to, you know, to not get into this attitude to think that, well, just because I have God's Spirit, just because I'm, I, I say I follow Christ or whatever, you know, I automatically am the winner in any engagement. That is not necessarily the truth, and we need to be careful and generate courage. We need to work on courage. We need to develop courage. And so the way I want to sort of attack this or talk about this today is to go to some go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Instead of talking about courage in um, in, in terms of um, theory, just hypothesizing over here, let's talk about things that would cause us not to be courageous, and let's deal with those. So I've come up with um, I've come up with three of them, and I think we can see them sort of sort of emanating out from the scriptures when we when we read first chronicles 28 20 be courageous do the work don't be afraid or discouraged so he gives them he says be courageous he challenges him do the work and then he says hey don't be don't be afraid or discouraged and so let's let's talk about some of these things first i think when we when we think about courage and if i were to say hey what's the opposite of courage one thing that might come to your mind, maybe, is uh, you ever see The Wizard of Oz, right? It's kind of an American classic, right? <laughs> I know we're going to stretch ourselves here to uh, to use our, our <laughs> pastoral prowess to tie in The Wizard of Oz with some kind of scriptural principle. But But don't worry, I think I'm up to the task. If you think Wizard of Oz and you think of the lion... Right? What was up with the lion? Well, he's known as the cowardly lion. The entire time, this guy is afraid of everything. He's afraid of his own shadow. And he's the lion. <laughs> right? I mean, like he, he's the lion. He's, he's like the typical male in America. 
right? You you are the one who should be the defender. You are the one who should be standing out in front. You are the one who should have the 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 inner fortitude, the power, the you know what I'm saying? And yet when when the spooks come, I mean you're you're sitting there crying like a baby. I do believe in spooks. I do believe in spooks. I do I do I do I do I do I do believe in spooks, right? Um it, you know, you can go watch the movie if you want to, but if you haven't seen it. But um right? And what was the thing that he needed? He needed courage, right? That heart of the lion. And so a lot of times what we think of when we are um when we are thinking the opposite or what would challenge our courage, we think of fear. We're afraid. We're, we're, we don't, we aren't courageous because we are af afraid. Um, and so, you know, timidity, cowardice, you know, things like that are, are what we would think of as opposites to, uh, to courage. But, but what are we afraid of is what I want to talk a little bit about. What, what are we afraid of? One thing we're afraid of is failure, right? People are afraid to fail. They're afraid to do. They're afraid to go um, forward with something. Maybe it's launching a new business. They're afraid to stand up to sometimes, right? Something like standing up to your kids, right? <laughs> like, hey, kid, this is not this is not the way this household is going to be run. Well, but we're afraid that we don't want to hurt their feelings. They're going to pout or whatever. Or we're afraid to you know stand up to our spouse, right? We're afraid to say, you know what? No, no, that's not right. That's not good. We can't allow that in our home. We, or we shouldn't do that. Or we look, we shouldn't be engaging in this behavior. We're afraid to stand up to society, right? This is a big one when it comes to the issues of identity and things like that, that I, we, I, I made mention of in our, our video from couple weeks ago. Go check that out. But it's people are afraid to say these things. They're afraid to stand on principle. They're afraid to, to speak out. And not even just scriptural principle. I mean, fact of nature. People are afraid to say things because what? Right? We're afraid. Um, we're afraid. But one of them, again, we're talking about failure specifically right now. We're afraid of failure. We're afraid we're going to fail. We're afraid that endeavor is going to fail. We're afraid that our efforts are going to fail. Um, and so we never even get started. Or we start, but we don't really give ourselves what we need, the time or the resources necessary to succeed because we're wimps. We're not warriors. We're afraid to fail. And so we we it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes. We set... we. Let me give you an example. We set ourselves up we're going to go ahead and do this. But in the back of our mind, we're afraid to fail. So we don't do it wholeheartedly. We don't put the attention that's needed, the resources. We don't give it enough time. And then we do end up failing. And see, I knew it was going to fail. Well, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. You thought you were going to fail. Therefore, you didn't really put in the courage necessary. And therefore, you failed. And so you just fulfilled your own prophecy. Um, what else are we afraid for? What are afraid of? Well, the scripture actually mentioned, right? Be courageous and do the work. Sometimes we're afraid of the work involved. It takes a lot of work to, to build and sustain things that are worthwhile. If we want a good family, let's say we want a good marriage. Let's start there. That, that takes a lot of work. Now I know that if you just, if you're, if you're, if you're getting your ideas of a good marriage from Hollywood or from some fiction novel, then you're going to be up a creek without a paddle. Well, you're probably going to have no boat either. <laughs> you're just going to be up a creek, just fl just floundering around. What's, what many people are not going to tell you, um, and what Hollywood is definitely not going to tell you, but what a lot of people do know, I could definitely recommend some good book suggestions and things. If anybody's interested, please, again, hit us up on Facebook or podcast at breadbreakers.com. I would love to uh, you know help in this area. But what many people are not going to tell you is that a marriage that is worthwhile, that's going to be long-term, is a lot of hard work. <laughs> hard work. And it's not that it's not worth it, because if it weren't worth it, then why do it, right? But it is, but it is still hard work. And most things that are worthwhile are hard work. Having a successful business, 
that's hard work or being a, a, a successful employee. Okay. Maybe you don't have any desire. You don't want to go own your own business or whatever, but it's still going to be hard work to set yourself apart from the others and, and receive promotions or things like that. It's hard work. You need to roll up the sleeves and do the hard work. And many people, we don't want to do the hard work. We don't want to be, we want to be healthy, but we don't want to wake up early and go to the gym. Okay. We want to be healthy, but we, we don't want to say no to that extra plate or those donuts or, or whatever, right? It's hard work. It's hard. We don't, we don't want to do that. Well, it depends on what your definition of hard is, I guess, but it's work. <laughs> it's not necessarily difficult. It doesn't take any, any special skill for some, something like health to just get a gym membership and go and actually work out. That doesn't take any special skill necessarily, but it's, it's difficult for a lot of people. So we are afraid of that. We cower from that. We, we, we avoid that. Now, some people will be, will be great. They'll get up and go to the gym, but they won't put the effort into their prayer life. They'll put the effort into their prayer life, but they won't succumb to the will of God and put in the hard, diligent effort to be the man, the husband, the father that they're supposed to be. And, and having children, if you want children, that is hard work to raise good children, to raise children as they're supposed to be raised. It's not hard work to have the children, <laughs> okay? No, it is, it's, it's after the having them. Now it, this little human being, this, this little human being that's not quite a blank slate, they do have a sort of a sinful nature, they do have their own uh, sort of makeup, already their you know personality and things like that um but nevertheless they uh they do require a lot of work and effort to make them into something that is um in conformity with the principles of God's word that that's not all that stuff's not just natural um what are some other things that we fear opposition now this could be just uh, this could be violent or nonviolent opposition, right? Um, uh, again, this is one of those things where I, I, I find it, I feel like sometimes people would be more willing to take a bullet for their spouse, right? I would die for you. You, you, you kind of mean it. You would jump in front of a bullet and die, but you won't just let your flesh die day in and day out and day in and day out. You would jump in front of a car, push them aside, right? But you won't stop being selfish because <laughs> that is day in and day out. It's much more difficult. Some people would take a bullet for their kids. I would die for my little baby, but you won't do the hard work of raising them right because that's more difficult, right? So when I say opposition, I don't just mean violent opposition, because in some ways, violent standing up to violent opposition in some ways is actually easier than standing up against the opposition that just comes daily from natural, just life pushes against us, right? So we do fear opposition. People do fear opposition. And this ties in with the work, right? Because we realize it's going to be work to get over those hurdles or to push past this thing or whatever. A lot of people fear change. Change is a fearful thing for some people. I mean, if you're a change agent, someone who loves to, you know, add value and change for the better and that kind of thing, you're going to be like, what? What do you mean? But yes, by and large, the majority of people like to put on cruise control and just coast. They don't like to change and might even fear change. So it's not even the, you can convince someone that, look, there's a lot of value for this change and they can even see it and agree with it like, up here, head knowledge, but then they won't want to do it because they're just afraid of change. They don't like changing. It's, it takes, again, looping into things like work. There's going to be opposition. What if I fail? So these all kind of loop in together, but they are somewhat somewhat different. So people are afraid of change. And also people are, are afraid of the unknown. People are afraid of the unknown. Um, I can't tell you how many people I know I've spoken to, counseled, um, I'm just aware of right? <laughs> that are, I'll use a religious example here. They, they're in a religious context. 
or in a religious setting. They know it's not the best thing for them and their family. They want change. They want something different. And they may even have identified something they could do that's different or even a place they could go that's different. But they're afraid of the unknown. What? But what if? But what if? There are people, again, that I know God has even dealt with in different situations. And if I'm talking to you and you hear this, and this is you, this is, this is a call. <laughs> this is a call to you. And of course, again, pe- Bread Breakers is very much a, you know, boots on the ground, roll up the, roll up the sleeves, get work done, be in the trenches type of uh, church. And so, we, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to put our, our blood, sweat, and tears where our mouth is. And if you're in this position, any of these, right, you're afraid of these things or whatnot, whatnot, you're in a position where, you know, you're in a religious setting, but you need help and counsel and guidance, we're happy to help. Um, confidentially, because a lot of times that can be, yeah, that can get a little, little strained. Um, but if you're in that position, reach out. I mean, we'd love to to help people right out of some of these these problems. But it's that that fear of the unknown, that next step where they can't see where a hundred percent down the path where it's going to lead. Of course, that's a false sense of security anyway, because where you are right now, you don't see every step. You think you do, but you don't see every step down the road. And I can give example after example, but I'm not dealing with you know this specifically um, right now. But I'll just suffice it to say, many people stay in the comfort zone only to be wiped out by the tidal wave that they thought was going to hit them if they made the change. <laughs> they thought if I go this direction, all these bad things are going to happen. So I'll say I'll I'll stay here where it's safe. And actually, what happened was that was where the tidal wave was hitting. Um, I've seen that happen in families. I've seen that happen in marriages. I've seen that happen with people. And again, it's that fear of the unknown, the what ifs. And we need to overcome those. Got some scripture for you. Jeremiah 1.8. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Ezekiel 2, 6 and 7. You, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you and you sit on scorpions... Be not afraid of their words, nor dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. When God called Jeremiah and Ezekiel, he called them to speak to rebellious nations, to nations that he knew did did not want to hear this, and might even, yes, violently, violently come after these prophets. And of course, we know they did. Um, you know, Jesus said, what, you know, which of the prophets did you guys, you know, not not kill, right? Um, I think it was right around that time in his discourse that Stephen got stoned, right? <laughs> like, you guys killed all these prophets, you guys have blood on your hands, you guys never wanted to hear the word of the Lord, right? And then they're like, well, we don't want to hear this. It's almost like they proved his point, <laughs> right? If you think about it, how dare you accuse us of that? We're going to stone you to death for saying that. <laughs> like, you're literally proving my point right now by stoning me. Um but Jeremiah and Ezekiel are getting commissioned by God, and his specific instruction to them is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And he specifically tells Ezekiel, you know, hey, you know, bad times might be coming here, and they may not even hear it. I'm going to send you to speak to them, and they may not even hear it. So forget about it. It's like they go into it knowing there's going to be opposition, knowing that there might even be quote-unquote failure. They're not going to hear it, but the success is in God said, I want you to do it. That success if they don't respond, that's on them. But I want you to do what I said to do. So going back to our fears, right? If our fear of failure is really not fear of being a good steward or witness or whatever in the kingdom of God, but really I'm afraid of failing in the outcome that I want, right? That's a problem. Right? We're, we're afraid of the work involved. We're afraid of violence and opposition, afraid of change, afraid of the unknown. But, but God is calling us that way anyway. God's not going to give a pass to people who forsake Him. He's not going to give a pass to people that ignore His financial, business, work-related principles. We don't, you don't get a pass um, because it was difficult or tough. We don't get a pass um, because 
you know, we where there was a lot of unknowns, and so I just stayed over here, even though you called me over there. Or, you know, I was you said to go left, and I went left, and then you said, okay, and now make a right, and left was comfortable, so I just kept going that way. We're not going to get a pass. And then Second Timothy one seven says, for God. God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And this is what we need to understand. Power, love, self-control. Fear does not come from God. Fear is something that will stop us from being courageous and standing for God. And I don't mean just standing for God on spiritual principles. I mean standing for God and doing finances His way. I mean standing for God and doing caring for our temple, the body that God has given us in the correct ways, right? Standing and and making sure that we are obeying Him in our marriage, in our children, right? Not what the world is saying, not what the Christian compromisers are saying, because they're all over the place. Um, What His Word says. So, fear is a massive one. The second one I want to talk about, so again, we're talking about I've identified three that I'm going to be talking about here. Three challenges to our uh, to our courage. And so the first one, just to reiterate, was the challenge of fear. People that are afraid. The second one is indifference, right? Because I, I can see where people would stand up and and want to go a certain way or do a certain thing, and it and then they stop. And it's not because of fear. It's because some challenge arises, some some obstacle or hurdle pops up, right? Somebody has a differing opinion or something, and then it's not that they're fearful, but they just they're indifferent. They they really didn't, they weren't like gung ho about that, and so why stand for it? Why be courageous? I'm indifferent about it anyway, and so I think indifference is a major problem. And in in stark opposition to being courageous. So we don't back down because of fear, but we back down because we just don't care enough. Um, Somebody gives up on their marriage, not because they're necessarily afraid of something, but because they don't care like they should. Um, People's children. I have watched children that are grown and have their own kids make horrible mistakes and do horrible things with their lives and really mess themselves up royally because of decisions their parents made when they were kids. So the parent raises children from the ages of 5, 10, 15, and puts things in their minds and stuff that's wrong, bad, not correct. You can, I think, head that off. If you, when that kid's 20 years old, you come to a realization of something in the Word of God, you come to, maybe you weren't, you were in sin, you weren't even living by God's principles and kingdom, and now you are going to a child and saying, I was wrong here and here and here, and I apologize, forgive me, but this is what's right. Ignore the way I raised you. This is what's right. I think we could, that that is helpful because a child psychologically, emotionally, even when they're 20, 25, 30, whatever, they will if they respect you as a parent, they will respect the fact that wow, dad is coming to me. This person that I respect is coming to me and apologizing and saying I did it wrong. Please understand that is not the way to do it. I think that is one very powerful way that parents can undo or help to undo damage that they have done to their children. The problem is, one, a lot of times we don't recognize the damage. Two, if we do, we are lax. We're, oh, they're grown now. They're their own person. And so we make excuses as to why we shouldn't go and correct um, the the bad things that we've done or put in them or the bad example that we were, right? A lot of people are good examples now in their 60s, but they were horrible examples when they were in their 30s raising their children. And I think that should be addressed, repented of, obviously before God first, but to our children, and then rectify it, you know? Not that you can do a whole lot about it, but at least you can say it and get the air clear, and then they can see that you don't now support their bad decision. Well, Dad did it this way. Yeah, Dad did it wrong. Stop doing it the way I did it, right? (laughs) That kind of thing. That takes courage right there, right? Um, But we can't be indifferent. We can't be indifferent about it. We, We need to be people of we are people of passion toward God. We are passionate about the things of God. 
were not just sort of kind of ambivalent. Eh, meh, right? The, the meh face, right? Meh, <laughs> right? We can't be meh about the things of God. We ha- The only way to be is toward God passionately, or we are on our way toward compromise through indifference. Let me give you some scriptures. Here we go. Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's Romans 12, 2. Now, conformity to the things of the world, I don't mean just the obvious, you know, top five to ten sins that are so on the surface obvious that if you've been living for God for a while, you're not even going to be tempted by that. Okay, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about below the surface mindsets that we develop. Now, I have been pastoring long enough to watch as people who are very prayerful, people that can pray circles around me, right? I mean, pray for hours, can still develop a mindset of the world that when they say things or they are in conversations about things, you're thinking, how can you possibly believe that? How can you possibly support that? How can you pot? And it's like, I'm no longer surprised. I used to be years ago. I used to be surprised. I'm no longer surprised because I realized you can be very prayerful, but God never is able to plant those seeds and change your mind. Um, people are, some people are very powerful in the Word, in the Scriptures, but unable to to transfer, you know, the scriptural knowledge into practical use. I'll give an example. Many people um, unknowingly or knowingly that are true blue, I believe, I'm not, obviously I'm not the final judge, but I believe saved they're prayerful. They know the Bible. They know abortion, for instance, is it, it's murder, right? And yet, either knowingly or or a lot of times unknowingly, they will support abortion. They will support it. Now, if you were to ask them, do you support abortion? They would say, absolutely not. No way, dude. That's murder. And they and they mean it. But they don't realize how the word and prayer and things like that should translate into practical living and practical action. Because I could say I'm against something all day long, but then when I support it with my actions, my belief systems, my mindset, (laughs) right? It doesn't matter. Your words don't matter, right? Words don't matter unless there's action behind them. And so we can't be indifferent. We actually need to be passionate about the things of God. And this is why I'm using this scripture to show that we can't be indifferent. He is saying that we have to actively be in a transformational process of our, not of the, our speech, of our mind, the way we actually perceive and see things and think about things. And then it should lead to action, right? That we are going to do the, the, the will of God. Right? You see the, you see the sort of the, um, the, the progression there right? Don't be conformed to the world. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, you need to be transformed. Okay, praise God, hallelujah, that I preach, transformed. Well, what does that really mean? What's the practical application there? Because preaching is no good if it's not practically applicable, (laughs) right? Preaching is just a pep rally, and I've been to a lot of preaching pep rallies. I've been to a lot of pep rallies where people were were sweating and dancing and shouting and ah, gnashing their teeth in a good way, right, toward God. Yeah, we're going to stomp on Satan. We're going to chew on a demon. Uh, But you don't chew on demons, (laughs) <laughs> right? You know how you chew on demons? You you don't go out and do things that support their position. That's how you that's how you chew on demons. You don't do it in a church service while everybody, you know, the music's pumping and the organs cranked up. That's an organ, by the way, for those of you that are just listening on Spotify. <laughs> uh that was my best organ impression. Um but that's, you know, people that get up and preach, and it's like, And the Lord said, I said the Lord said. I mean, is there a point here? Or how do we apply this? If the Lord said, and there's organ in the background for 20 minutes, and again, if that's your preaching style, I'm not saying that 
stylistically that's wrong. I'm saying your preaching and your teaching and, and our belief has to have substance to it. And so if your point is you need to change your thinking on this topic and you're going to repeat it 17 times with the musicians blasting in the background, that's fine. That's your style of, of, of getting the message out there. Fine. But there needs to be a substantive message. It just doesn't need to be destroy demons and be transformed. And then music. What does that even mean? Right? How are we transformed? He tells us in the scriptures. See, scriptures are always practically applicable if we'll just watch for it. Preaching is not always practically applicable. We, we need to be aware of that. We need to watch for that. Um, but, <laughs> but here we go. Change the way you think. The world is trying to get us to think a certain way. Uh, 200 years ago, it was this way, but now things have changed and certain psyches and certain mental things, certain uh, knowledge has gotten into the culture, and now they're trying to think, get us to think uh, this way. And then 50 years from now, it'll be the world is trying to push us in a box this way. But what we need to be is be on guard and be transformed into the image of God and not be conformed to the thinking patterns of the world. If your knee-jerk reaction to a specific Let's take a topic like marriage, a topic like raising children, a topic like what your work ethic should be like, a topic like what is a church body, what is the purpose, what should it look like, what should it be like, a, a topic like politics. If what you say sounds a whole lot like the general populace of the world, that should be a red flag. That's not 100% like it sounds like somebody on TV, so therefore it's definitely against God, but it should definitely, our knee-jerk reaction should be, that sounds like somebody on TV, so it's probably against God. I need to search the scriptures <laughs> because the world is trying to conform us to its mindset. How does it do that? Through the systems of the world, through media, through you know television, through Hollywood, through sports, through entertainment through politics. These are the these are the methods through through work, corporations, business, billboards, right? I mean, everything in the world is trying to get us to think like the world. And God is saying, you have to you can't be indifferent because if you're indifferent, you're going to be like the world. And I have met so many good quote unquote, right? I mean, I put it in quotes because only God really knows if I'm good or you're good or anybody's good, right? But I'll say good people that are Christians, they love God. And yet, they are conformed to the thinking of the world, and they, it destroys their lives. It ruins marriages, even in the church. It ruins the next generation, even in the church. It ruins finances, gobbles them up. People could be with God. They could be blessed and really have, have something of substance, but they, they conform to the world's thinking, and either get rich quick and it destroys them, or they're flat broke all the time, and it's because they won't conform to God, be transformed to God's way of thinking. They're conformed to the world. Doesn't mean they're not saved, but I, you know, I don't personally, I don't want to be saved, but have a horrible marriage, uh, raise kids that are going to hell, um, and be totally broke and die early because my health is absolutely horrendous. That's not my idea of live in this life. Personally, I, yes, absolutely. The, the, the primary thing is eternal, but I, I want to conform to the things of God, even in all these other spheres and all these other areas, and, and have a life. Personally, I wouldn't mind being healthy, wealthy, and have great kids, wonderful marriage, and be the envy of even people in the world, while also being a man of God. <laughs> I wouldn't I, I'm, I'm, that's my goal, okay? I don't know what your goal is. <laughs> Maybe it's different. Maybe you're indifferent. So, again, that we, we need to be transformed. Now, look, we're still, we're still kind of looking at the, um, we're still kind of looking at the, uh, uh, the progression here. Uh, well, did you see that? Like, the, the lights turned on in the room. <laughs> again, sorry, Spotify folks, but, you know, if you're driving or whatever, you don't need to be watching this anyway, but had the, uh, had the lights cranked down. Now they just, like, the, the motion detector picked me up because I was moving too much. Um, anyway, so uh, we we don't want to be conformed to the world. We don't want to be 
conformed to the world. And so transform our minds, but then he says that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And what is he saying there? Right? Not just in your mind, but then we actually need to be doing the will of God. But you can't you can't do the will of God effectively. You now you can hit you know, a broke clock is right twice a day, right? So you can't be effective in the kingdom of God like you're supposed to be um, without your mind being changed first. You're thinking like God, you're thinking his principles. So interesting progression there. Revelation chapter 3 actually gets on this too, right? The, the idea of indifference. Revelation 3, 15 through 17, I know your works, you are neither hot or cold. I would that you were either hot or cold. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth, for you say, I'm rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So what happened? Their, their wealth, their, their prestige, their affluence helped them to be indifferent about the kingdom of God, indifferent about the things of God. And because of that indifference, Jesus Christ himself says, I would rather you be hot or cold, but because you're this way, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That is not a good thing, <laughs> okay? In case you're wondering, that is not a good thing. That is not a, ooh, we want that. This sounds a lot like the guy in Luke 12, right, where he says, right, I'm going to say to my soul, you know, take a rest, man. I've, I've built these bigger barns. I'm good. He becomes indifferent. He's not, he's not passionate about continuing to, to, to be transformed, push for God, be, be, be wealthy, right, quote-unquote wealthy in God. But no, I'm just going to sit down, rest, oh my soul. That is not what God wants. And Jesus spoke very unfavorably of that particular gentleman, not because he wanted to have bigger barns. God, he's not, he's not a, opposed to some, oh, tear your barns down, build bigger ones, fine, go for it. It was when he got to the point where I'm good. You get that attitude, I'm good, I'm good. That's the attitude that God hates. Matthew eleven sixteen 16, and 17. But to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace calling to their playmates, we played the flute for you, you didn't dance, we sang a dirge, you didn't mourn. So, right, you're, you're just indifferent. You're not, you're not movable. It, it doesn't matter if we... Uh, sing a, a lively tune and get you to try and dance and praise and woo yeah man wow that, this is this is rocking, or if we sing a sad you know oh start crying and come come and just fall before God and broken hearted and just oh cry out to God you don't do either, it doesn't matter either way we go it doesn't matter what is tried you won't be shaken from your indifference and so indifference is a very very deadly poison to being courageous. And we need to be people that are courageous. The last one, we have fear, we have indifference. And, and, and the last one is, I'll say, disappointment. Disappointment. Those that, and what I mean by that is those that are faint-hearted. This is where the, the word fortitude I like the word fortitude a little bit better than courage when we're talking about these cardinal virtues. Because fortitude, right, it, it, just the connotation of it, in my opinion, okay, I could be wrong here. If it's not for you, then, then it's not for you. If you I'm, this is how I see it. The, the, I, the connotation has more of a, it's long lasting. It stands the test of time, right? Courage, I think, you know, yeah, you could be, you could be courageous in one single act and then be a total wimp the rest of your life, right? But fortitude, that is, it's ongoing. It's, it weathers the storm, right? Uh, all of my, all of my fellow Floridians and, and those in this, you know, the Southeast, right? The storm that's going through right now, a little Hurricane Elsa, um, <laughs> <laughs> Let it go. Um, but that's right, that 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 probably should let that overused joke go, actually. Um, but that that is what I see. Fortitude. The storm's raging. Today we stand firm. Tomorrow it's great weather and we're still standing firm. Another storm in six months, and we're we're there, we're strong. That's fortitude. 
And that's what I mean by disappointment or being faint hearted. Um, it's, it's courage over time. It's lasting courage. So remember the first verse we, we went to where David was talking to Solomon. He says, don't be discouraged. I think generally discouraged is more of a wearing down process. We get worn down because courage is not a flash in the, in the pan. It can be an act of courage, well, quote unquote, an act of courage. An act of courage does not make you. One act of courage does not a courageous man make, right? <laughs> Maybe we should say it that way. Just because you do something and that act was courageous doesn't mean you are a courageous person. doesn't mean you have fortitude. Oh, yay, you woke up today and you, you hit the gym instead of slept in and you ate healthy to try and you know, be alive for a little while longer for the kingdom and for, for people that need you or whatever, right? Well, that, that act today was courageous. Will you be courageous tomorrow? Or did you do that, but then you came home and yelled at your wife? Or, right, that, or, that doesn't make you a courageous person. It means you had some courageous actions. So that's better than non-courageous actions, but it doesn't make us people that have fortitude. I think you get my point. Um, so we, we don't have that tenacity to be courageous um, consistently, consistently courageous. Not just consistently through time, but also consistently across the board. So again, we can, I'm using my workout example, right? Because I've seen this. I actually have seen this in, in practical life. Um, ooh, there's light going off. Um, in, in life itself, I have seen where people, they can be very against the grain in their health, for instance. I mean, they are faithful to the gym. They are faithful to their diet and exercise routines. And that's good. I mean, I, I believe in that. I push that. Um, here locally, and if you'd like to join in, let us know. Again, hit us up on Facebook or if you know somebody. But um, we've been challenging the men for, for the last several weeks and just going on on a weekly basis, um, teaching folks in kind of a health and wealth sphere, um, talking about finances and stuff and doing a little bit of that, and then meeting together weekly for some physical exercise and, and, you know, playing some sports and doing things to help encourage each other and try to build that community around that. So I'm big on that. I am for that. Um, but if you do that and then you have a horrible work ethic, you're not courageous. <laughs> you do cur you do courageous things in your, in your health, but we need to be courageous across the board and over time. Maybe that's what I should say here. Uh, fortitude is courage across the board and over time. That's fortitude. And that's what I'm, I want to say here now. It's we, we don't get worn out by disappointment. We don't get worn out by, by setbacks, by, by hurdles, by obstacles. Um, newsflash, in, in case you just, you know, this is a public service announcement, a little PSA for you right now. Life is absolutely full of disappointments, okay? It's not, hopefully your life or anybody's life is not only disappointments. Because <laughs> um, uh, then at that point, I guess you just need to set your goal at, hey, I'm going to have a life full of disappointments. And then you can, you know, you can achieve that goal and not be disappointed. But there's lots of disappointments, lots of setbacks all over the place. Setbacks, you know, you thought your marriage was going to be this way and then you hit a roadblock and you had to work through some things and, you know, everything's not going your way 100%, you know, uh, wind in your sails and all this stuff. Um, you know, there's there's disappointments, you know, you're raising your kids and you, there's disappointments there and things happen. You're disappointed in the way you did this or that or you're disappointed in how they reacted to this or that. I mean, it's going to happen. Disappointments in your job. You thought you were going to get the promotion. You you were the one, man. And then this other guy had an in where you didn't knew somebody who knew somebody and they got the job instead of you, right? And you're disappointed. It, I mean, there's so much disappointment in life. And so this is where in order to have this level of courage, Across the board and over time, we need what's called resilience. It's bounce backedness. <laughs> okay. We have the ability to bounce back. Um, I don't know if you know who Simon Sinek is. He's a pretty popular 
uh, guy. He he does a lot of TED talks. Have some you know some books or at least one book. <laughs> um, but he did a a, a tremendous little bit uh, and it's out there and people you know take his his speech it's like 12 to 16 minutes depending on how people how people splice it out but he, he talks about millennials he talks about the generation and and what we're what we're facing right now and and um, people put it you know with some music in the background you know dramatize it a little bit but he has some really great things to say and one of the things he talks about is resilience and how people are trained they they can't handle setbacks they 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 can't handle the disappointment. They, you know, they're, they're snowflakes who are told you're super special and you're, you're one of a kind. You can do every, anything you put your mind to and you, you know, you, uh, you get a horrible grade, but we say it's awesome and we put it in green marker for you and you get a trophy for participating, even though your team lost and you were the worst on your team. Um, you still get a trophy just like everybody else and this kind of stuff. And what it does is it, it builds in people the inability, it builds a negative. It builds the inability. It creates an inability for people to deal with disappointment. They can't deal with disappointment. They can't deal with setbacks. And so what happens is even some of the most laughable disappointments, right? I didn't get enough likes on this video or, you know, I mean, folks, people, there is more depression and anxiety, I think, in the United States than there are in places like Saudi Arabia or places where people are really under the gun, literally. Why would that be? Because we don't raise people with resilience. They don't have fortitude. They don't have courage over time. Um, and I think that's a, a real problem. It's a real problem that we have got to face. We've got to, we've got to find ways to help people in their now their 20s and 30s become resilient. Their parents may have flubbed it up and didn't put it in them. Or maybe they tried, but society around, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't as intentional about it as they should be. And their kids grew up to be, you know, one of these, uh, again, it's, it is a sort of a slur, <laughs> but, you know, a snowflake. You know, I'm so unique. And I'm so, and as soon as the sun comes out, gone right? Um, can't handle that opposition. Can't handle uh, somebody bringing constructive criticism. Somebody that loves them, loves you, that comes and says, this needs to change. This is hurting you. And it's like, oh my gosh, how dare you? Dude, if everybody is always just singing your praises, that's called an echo chamber. Everybody's always agreeing with you. That's an echo chamber. That's not good. That is no bueno. We need to have people that can speak into our lives, that love us, that can um, be critical of us. And I apologize. <laughs> Not going to hit that 45 minutes in case you uh, didn't didn't figure that out 13 minutes ago. <laughs> we'll try better next time. Um, but we need to have people in our lives that that we're accountable to. And accountability is not a group of people that slap each other on the back and good job, bro. That's an echo chamber. Um, what we need with accountability is people that, yes, when we're doing well, they'll they'll slap us on the back, say you're doing well. When um, when there's something that we, we can grow in, they're making making suggestions. Have you thought about this? And when we're not doing well, they will point it out and help us to do better. Right? We need that. And too much of our society just throws that completely out the window. And that's why, one of the reasons why we have so much anxiety, so much depression, people can't cope. They can't deal. How how dare this person fire me for, you know, showing up late constantly, and then they warned me and said, if, they do, if I do it again, I'm going to be fired. And then I did it again, and they fired me. Oh my gosh, what do I do? This is, my world is crumbling. The life is over, right? Or I did everything right and I didn't get the promotion I was promised. Or I did everything right and I was downsized. Or, I mean, in my professional career, I have been downsized. I would, I, uh, through zero fought, 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 through zero fought, through zero fault of my own, I was let go from a, from a, a you know, a good directorship position. I mean, it was a, you know, I, I was a controller at a, at a multi-million dollar company. And um, 
basically plans didn't work out like they had they had intended. Board of directors said needs to be a decision made here. Well, I wasn't making the decision. My boss was. So, you know, if it was him or me, who do you think is going to go? It's going to be me. I mean, that's just the way things work, folks. I didn't go into deep depression. I mean, was I happy about that? Of course not. Um, and it doesn't mean that we have to be happy about everything that happens to us. We have to go, yay, I was fired. Yay, the doctor gave me bad news. Yay, my, you know, my spouse, you know, just, you know, gave me a verbal tongue lashing for no reason. Yay, my kids, you know, slammed their door and shook their fists and said they hate me because of this decision. Yay. You know, th that is not what, what I'm saying. That would be fake. What I'm saying is we need to be resilient. I think I'm making my my point. I'm, tr I'm really trying to um, without belaboring the point. We need resilience. We need that fortitude. When things come against us, and they will. When disappointments happen, they will. When setbacks happen, they will. One thing I can promise you is you will have setbacks. I can't promise you that you will succeed in whatever specific endeavor you're going for, but I can just about promise you there will be some kind of setback. <laughs> Might be setback, 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 and then failure. Or it could be setback, 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 and then you push through and boom, it's huge success. But the consistent thing is the setback, 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 right? So, um, but scripture has some things to say about this. First, first Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety, some versions say all your cares on him, right? On Jesus, because he cares for you. This is so important. We need to get God in view because sometimes it's a, a setback or discouragement or a disappointment is just because we had the wrong thing in view. We, our cares weren't really on him. They were on him-ish. As long as he was you know, going to give us that promotion, our cares were on him. They were on him-ish. We can't do that. They really need to be on him. And if we believe all this stuff that we say we believe, right? we, suppose, we allegedly believe that God is in control, that he is sovereign, that he has all power, he knows all things, he's omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, right? If, if we really believe that and something doesn't go our way, then, okay, why? <laughs> Either we need to check ourselves and we were, it didn't go our way because we weren't aligned with how God wants to do things, or we were aligned with how God wants to do things and God decided not to step in and stop that, okay? Now, I am not speaking hypothetically. <laughs> I'm literally just 24 hours off of a huge disappointment um, that I'll share a little bit about. Um, this is a legal dispute, a legal issue that really, uh, I mean, let me just say this. Legally, um, and speaking with our lawyer and stuff, legally, the other party who, who brought the lawsuit to us uh, had zero case. They had zero case. I mean, they completely lied. And we had emails and correspondence and documentation. And actually, the lawyer was like, man, you guys, above my average clients, I mean, you guys are have crazy documentation. You've done a wonderful job here. And so we, you know, we kind of won. We, But you know what kind of winning kind of cost us? Tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. And that's one thing that people don't understand sometimes about our mm, so-called justice system is that you can be the winner of a case and walk away and feel like the loser because in order to win or to make your point, it you know it could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and all this stuff. And so we you know we got to a point where it was like it's going to cost us more to prove that this person is lying and prove that we are right than to just meet somewhere in the middle and move on. And that's what we had to do. And I'm going to tell you right now, I was I was not happy with that. Um, I was upset. I was angry. I was uh, miffed. Um, I wasn't living my best life. And I posted on Facebook, and I let everybody know. And I, I was just, I took pictures of myself in the car, crying and looking up to God. And No, of course I didn't do that because I'm a man, and men don't do that. Um, but what I did do is driving home, I mean, I, I did talk to God, and I did tell him, I, I'm not happy with this. Like, I'm frustrated. 
I'm frustrated. I'm angry. <laughs> I don't like this. Do you know why I didn't like it? Well, because I didn't want it to go that way. I do believe that God has all power, and he could have made this go away. He could have dropped a huge check on us, to, and maybe he still will, uh, but he could have dropped a huge check on us just to pay for all this and make it go away. I mean, there's there's a million, literally a million different things, ways that God could have done this and, and stepped in, and he chose not to, okay? He chose not to. He chose not to make it go away. Now, maybe... You know, maybe he chose to let it go to this point so that we can have some understanding and um, be a little more cautious and things like that going forward. Or maybe this was just a, a a time of testing and trial to build some character. And that, I mean, that's certainly possible. But I, I, I really don't know. It could just be that God sometimes just doesn't do what we want him to do. <laughs> He's God. We're not. And. So I let him know, and then, of course, I let him know, but hey, but not my will, but yours be done. Yours be done. I mean, if Jesus can pray that in the garden, this is Jesus. <laughs> if he can say, you know, I don't want this, this isn't the way I want it to go, but your will be done, That then I, I certainly can pray that, and I wasn't getting crucified. Um, And and don't, don't get me wrong here. I'm right here in the book. Check this out. Job 13 and 15. This is one of the most popular scriptures of all time, but most people don't realize there's a second clause in the same verse. Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, or I will hope in him. Everybody knows that part. Do you know the second part? Same sentence literally says, yet I will argue my ways or my case before him or to his face. <laughs> right? <laughs> so Job is saying, ultimately, even if God himself is slaying me, I will trust, I will hope in him. But I'm still going to let him know how I feel about this. <laughs> so Psalm 62 and 8 says it this way, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. <laughs> God is a refuge for us, Selah right? The Bible is a practical book. It is a realistic book. It understands, it, well, it, God understands, the writers understand, the prophets understand, the apostles understand that we are people, and there, there are going to be things that happen that frustrate us, that hurt us, that grieve us, and we can cry out to God. We can let him know, God, I'm so angry right now. God, I'm so frustrated. I'm so disappointed. This hurts. This hurts right now. This, this, this stinks. <laughs> I do. But what that should not do is it should not cause us to get discouraged, fully discouraged. It 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 should not stop us from our trust in Him, our hope in Him. It should not stop us from being resilient, because that could be God testing our resilience, and our character. And of course, we know from Scripture this is exactly how God operates. Actually, when, when I was, we were on our way back from the from the, the meeting, and, you know, it's like, yeah, I just write a check, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And, you know, uh, my father was like, you know, you know, this is a lot of times, this is how God tests us. I'm like, yeah, I know that. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm fully aware of that. Like, I know that, of course. But still, this stinks, right? Um, so it's not the, a lack of knowledge sometimes on our part. It's a, what we have to do is let that knowledge translate into a transformation. We don't act like the world. We, we suck it up, buttercup. Suck it up, buttercup. Sometimes that's what you need to do, buttercup, is suck it up. So I had to do that. I've had to do that. I literally, within the last 24 hours, had to do that. So I am in, I'm standing on firm ground to tell you, who, who might be listening or watching, suck it up, buttercup. We've, we've got to be people that are resilient. That does not mean we can't cry out to God. That doesn't mean we can't look for support or in the community of the church around us. That doesn't mean any of that. But what it means is, ultimately, we have to trust in God. We have to continue walking on His path. We have to be resilient. That is not an excuse not to be courageous. Lastly, Second or last scripture here, Second Samuel 12, 19 and 20. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. 
Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house, and when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. His baby was killed. His baby. His baby. Think about your child. Think about whatever is, you know, some people just love their pets. I mean, okay, but it's a dog. Think about your baby dying. He is fasting, begging God, humbling himself, right? Putting on sackcloth and all this stuff. That's why it's saying he anointed himself, changed his clothes. I mean, he is just doing everything he possibly can. Please, God, please, God, mercy, 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 please, God, please, God, grace here, please. And God said no. And his, not, he said no, and you didn't get the promotion. He said no, and you didn't get that brand new car upgrade. He said no, and okay, you didn't get the, the you know, as many likes on your Facebook post. Or he said, not that. He said no, and this man's child died. And what, and, and the servants, the scriptures let us know that they were, they were concerned. I mean, is he going to kill himself? What's going to go on here? Oh my gosh. They didn't want to tell David. That's why they were whispering. <laughs> and um, what did David do? His reaction was to go to the house of the Lord. Let me encourage you, your community around you. I, now, I feel bad for you, and I've already said, reach out on Facebook. We'd love to help you. We'd love to encourage you and work with you. If your church body is not one of community and love to help you through times of trial and pain, through times of even a failure, you 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 admit some addiction, you admit something you've done, and 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 but you want to repent and you want to do right and you want to you want to move forward. If your church body and community is not one that will help you and heal and move in and this kind of thing, you are in the wrong place. That is not what the church is supposed to be, and you need a new place so that you can do this right here. Because our response should be to go before God, and and not just fly it solo. We should be in community. He goes to his house. This is when he breaks his fast. He breaks his fast after his kid dies, okay? Lessons, lessons, lessons to be learned from the life of David, right? And we could go through some of those, but I think I'll skip that. Um, just let it be, let it be known. There's lots of lessons to be, to be found in resilience and courage and fortitude, from the life of David, but maybe we'll talk about some of those in some of the other areas when we go through this. Um, he had every he had every opportunity through his life to grow fearful, resentful, indifferent, get discouraged. Right? He trusted God, but he made mistakes. But then he trusted God, and he he suffered disappointment. But then he trusted God, and he had setbacks. And he trusted God, and had bad things happen. And he trusted God, and friends betrayed. And he trusted God. You see the pattern here. But he trusted God. He held to God. And there were times he wrote many of the Psalms, and he let God know exactly how he felt. But he trusted God, and he clung to God, and he was courageous. He was courageous. And so we should take our view of courage from men like David. We should not become indifferent. We should not be afraid. And we should not get disappointed. We should not let the slow and steady drip of the world beat the courage that we once had out of us because we don't want to put our courage into another sphere or realm or apply it to a different situation or because we don't want to hold to it over time. We need to be warriors, not wimps. Warriors are warriors in their family. They're warriors for their marriage. They're warriors for their children. They're warriors in their finances, their health. Warriors in their church. They're warriors individually and warriors collectively. Warriors before God. This is how warriors operate. Let me encourage you to be a warrior. Let me encourage you to be full of courage. I love you. I hope this has blessed you, and we will catch you on the next podcast. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that content from Bread Breakers. If you enjoyed the content, give us that thumbs up. And if you have any suggestions on future content or anything like that, don't forget to leave us a comment in the comment section. Also, subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way, every time we put out something new, a new video, a new interview, whatever it might be, 
you will be notified. We will throw some additional videos and playlists up here on the screen. And as always, God bless you. We'll catch you on the next video.